It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. Uh, last week, Amazing Facts and uh, yours truly went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And part of the reason we were there is about once a year, the religious broadcasters of North America get together for a convention, and there's a lot of very helpful information at that convention. But we also went to uh, meet with our friends in the Madison Campus Church in Madison, Tennessee, just on the outskirts of Nashville. And the Lord really blessed. It was just a, we called it a faith summit weekend. It's something of uh, an inspirational weekend, a revival. It was just great to get together with friends and, and to meet the people. But uh, for me, one of the very exciting parts was the actual convention, the Religious Broadcasters Convention. Now, this is a time when Christian broadcasters from North America get together and they share what things are happening in the uh, in the church and in the media that uh, new technologies for getting the gospel out and there's a lot of information there about what's happening with sharing the gospel through internet and various equipment and satellite and uh, they also share what's happening politically that may prevent the free proclamation of the gospel because they're just as interested in the religious liberty to preach the message freely and that's being restricted right now. Now when Amazing Facts goes to these conventions it's in a big hotel, Dallas or Nashville or somewhere, and most of the conventioneers come and stay at the same hotel. Amazing Facts usually rents one of the channels in the hotel, and we put Amazing Facts programs that three or four sermons that will rotate 24 hours a day on this channel. Some of you have been on a hotel before where one of the channels is the hotel channel. Well, in this convention, they got several hotel channels, and so we put our programs on there. My thinking is these religious leaders, and you know, at this convention, uh, you know, James Dobson was there, and I could just go down the line, and uh, Mike Huckabee was there. He spoke to the different people, and I could name names, and you, just about any ministry has, uh, major ministries have representation there. And so my thinking is, I'm always thinking evangelistically, that these leaders are staying in the hotel and when they're back in the rooms I want them to hear our messages. <laughs> and so I've done this for several years now and uh, with mixed response <laughs> but I'm, I'm tenacious I think it's going to make a difference. They're going to hear, they're going to find out we're Bible Christians and we're going to give them Bible reasons for what we believe and we pick those messages very carefully too. Well, you know, the first few years I went to NRB, first time I went to NRB was 25-something years ago with the Heritage Singers. That's when I first met George Vandeman, was at a religious broadcaster's convention. And uh, the attitude about Seventh-day Adventists, and I might tell you now if you're visiting, this is sort of an in-house Seventh-day Adventist sermon today, so hopefully you'll be understanding. But the attitude about Seventh-day Advent Adventists was, hey, it was a little edgy, kind of, you kind of sense that there wasn't that warm embrace that some of the evangelicals have towards one another, but it's been changing. Matter of fact, uh, while I stood at my booth one day, and we've got these booths on the convention floor, and there are hundreds of booths, and uh, we had a great spot right near the main entrance. Uh, we are right across from Answers in Genesis. Some of you have heard of Ken Ham and his ministry, Answers in Genesis. He was right next door to us here and had to look at us quite a bit. And uh, one of the presidents of NRB came by our booth. And we've got some of the Amazing Facts people there and some volunteers. And he came up to me and he said, Brother Doug, and I didn't know who he was at first, but he's wearing this badge with all these ribbons. And, and he said, he introduced himself. He looked familiar. And he said, yeah, I'm former president of NRB. And uh, I was actually on board when we first allowed the first Seventh-day Adventists to be part of this convention. Uh, because there's some groups they will not allow. And they, they said, we're trying to figure out if you guys were Christian or a cult. And we finally decided you're Christians. <laughs> and so we, uh, he said, I want you to know I watch your programs. And he said, and I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> now, 
because I was running a program this weekend in the hotel that was the health message. Some of you know where I do the back handspring. And so it was talking about the Bible reasons for not eating unclean food and healthful living. And uh, he said, you know, more of our pastors need to watch that. And uh, they actually had an article in the magazine talking about one of the chronic problems among evangelical pastors is because their jobs are so sedentary, they're not taking care of themselves, and that they need to rethink how they're interpreting health and the Bible and Christianity. So I, that was right in, the article was in the hotel when I got there from the NRB, and here we're playing our health message in the hotel. So that was great timing, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm going to lunch one day during the convention, and this couple that has a national radio program, and um, many of you would recognize their names, but I don't know if they want me to tell this to you, uh, because this will be broadcast. And they pulled me aside, and they said, Brother Doug, said, do you have plans for lunch? And it was, you know, like 11.45 or 12 o'clock. I said, matter of fact, no, I was just praying, Lord, if there's someone you want me to eat lunch with, let me know who it is. I just prayed that, really. And then these people out of the blue said, Brother Doug, can you have, will you have lunch with us? And I said, sure. So we went down to one of the, the local uh, buffets there and, and we're eating together. And while we're eating, a great conversation, but I'll tell you one thing. They said, uh, you've caused all kinds of problems for us. <laughs> they said, we've been watching your program for years and I'd met them before. And they said, uh, we accepted the Sabbath. And they go to a Sunday church and they shared it with their family and their, their daughter is, is now keeping the Sabbath. Uh, she's an adult, she's married, and actually she's married to a Messianic Jew, so it makes it easier. <laughs> and they said, we shared it with our church. And so many in our church accepted it that we finally had to vote in our church whether or not the whole church would begin. Oh, by the way, this guy was part of James Dobson's Sabbath School. So, I mean, this fellow is well known. He's had a radio booth. He was doing live programs from the convention. He said, we actually voted in our church whether or not to keep the Sabbath, and we lost by one vote. And they said, I know, I wish I could tell you it was all good news. But they said, you know, so we're keeping the Sabbath in our home and we still go to church on, uh, on Sabbath with, with our friends and there's a lot of us that are Sabbath keepers in this church. And I was hearing stories like this all weekend. People were coming up to us and saying, oh, we've been listening to your messages and I agree with you. Now, not everyone said they agreed. Um, while I was at the governor's dinner, Mike Huckabee was talking to, there was a banquet, and some of us who are broadcasters were invited to come. James Dobson was there and a number of others you'd recognize. And um, after the dinner, and the people that sat down from on the right and the left of me from different parts of the country, one was from Israel. He says, my kids love your program. They watch you on Middle Eastern television. And this guy lives in Israel. And he came and deliberately sat down next to me because, uh, and I just sat down at an empty table. I came early and and this other fellow, he's part of an uh, international mission program, and he saw the programs. And uh, afterward, I got up when you shake hands as we're leaving the dinner. The president of Moody Bible Institute looked across the room. He came over to me, and he said, Bachelor. His name, is, his name is Erwin Lutzer. Some of you know the name. Radio program, TV program, been the pastor of the, uh, he's the pastor of the Bible, Moody Bible Church in Chicago. And I've quoted him before in my sermons. He's, got, he's a good Christian man. He's got some great quotes. And he said, Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, I want you to know I watch your programs. I don't agree with everything. <laughs> but he, went, he said, I think you do a good job. You're a good communicator. And he was very kind. And I wanted to say, well, what don't you agree with? Let's talk about it. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're surrounded by all these people there. And I was meeting with another Jewish brother. He said, will you let me come and talk to your church about the, you know, the relationship between the Jews and Christians and, and I've, all these people out there are watching the programs. Matter of fact, while I was standing in line to go to this governor's dinner, there were actually two dinners and I started out in the wrong line. And I went up to the booth and said, I'm supposed to have a, a, a ticket for the dinner. And they said, your name? And I told them, they said, oh, we know you. We watch your programs. And they're looking around and they said, we can't find your name anywhere. Now this was, they said, are you sure you're supposed to have a, a banquet ticket for the, din the dinner being put on by the Israel nation? 
And I said, well, maybe. I said, are there other dinners? And they said, well, there is another dinner, but we, we'll give you a free ticket. And it was a $140 ticket. They said, we'll give you a free ticket if you come to this dinner. And two ladies were standing there. They said, this is the man. <laughs> now listen to this story. <laughs> now this, I found out I'm at the wrong dinner. But God arranges these things. <laughs> they didn't want me to go to the governor's dinner. They knew all about the governor's dinner. They wanted me to come to the Israel dinner because I'm half Jewish. They said, you've got to come to our dinner. These two ladies are standing here and they said, this is the man. They said, remember we were telling you about this service we went to yesterday. What had happened, these two Messianic Jews, they're Christians, they're Messianic Christians, they were driving through Nashville and they got lost. And they drove by, and this is on Sabbath, and they drove by the Madison Campus Church. And they must have really been lost because they're not even in Nashville anymore. They, so I don't know how they found the street where this is. But, and they saw all the cars. They said, wonder what's happening here. And they saw it was Adventists. They said, oh, these are Adventists. They're Sabbath keepers. We're Messianic Jews. Let's go in. So they had no idea what the meeting was. They came in off the street, and they sat down, and they saw the program, and they got there in time to hear Stephen sing. These are the ones Stephen uh, sing during the program. And then I did another message, and they said, oh, this is great. We've seen these programs. So then I run into them at the ticket counter for the Israeli dinner, and they're watching. And these people are listening. Now I could go on and I could tell you story after story of just incredible things that were happening. But it was so exciting to see that the message is getting out. And something else that I was really impressed by is that so many of these people are dear Christian people. And as I exchanged with them and visited with them, I found, boy, there's a lot of areas where we believe the same on certain subjects. And uh, there is a great harvest of people that is hidden out there among what I might call the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they're not all lost sheep, don't misunderstand. But these are people who are God's children. Okay, kids, Miss Renhifo told you to pick a word. Count how many times I say sheep during this sermon. And then you show that. You might tell me what the number is afterward. I want to see how many of you get close to the same number. Count how many times I say sheep. And uh, your parents will reward you somehow. <laughs> afterward. <laughs> but I want to start with a story. In our memory, in our scripture reading, um, we were reading that verse where Jesus said, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must call. They'll hear my voice. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. Now turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 416. And if I was to give a subtitle to this sermon, it would be, How do Seventh-day Adventists relate to other Christians? How do Seventh-day Adventists relate to Christians from other faiths? Luke chapter 4, start with verse 16. So he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. He was a good Jewish boy. They knew him. He was eloquent. And they said, oh, Jesus is here. Let's have him read today. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written. That means he went to the place in the scroll. It's Isaiah 61, actually, verse 1 and 2. And Jesus commenced to read a prophecy that foretold his coming. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant. They actually had someone that would guard the scriptures there. And he sat down. In the eyes of all who are, you notice why we stand when we read the scripture here at Central Church? In the book of Ezra, they stood to read the scripture. Jesus stood to read the scripture. And then he sat down and he taught. Well, I'm not going to sit down, but you do. You'd never see me if I sat down. And he said to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? They're saying, Boy, what he's saying is so wonderful, but we've known him since he was a kid. Isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? What's happened to him? All of a sudden, he's got this public ministry that is so powerful, and they'd heard about it. 
And Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he said, you'll surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever you've heard done in Capernaum, do also in your country. Then he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. It's hard to reach people from your own country sometimes. And then Christ goes on in verse 25, and this is, this is the key point I want you to catch from this passage. Jesus said to them, I tell you, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a great famine in the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath, unto the region of Zidon, a non-Jewish widow, a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, but none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Wow, that was really unpopular to say that. You see, the Jewish people sort of had this exclusive idea that they were the chosen people and that everybody else out there was accursed by God and that all of the blessings of God belonged to them and they were favored and they were loved by God and everyone else was hated by God. And they had really sort of developed a cult mentality that said that we're exclusive and we're favored and we're special and everyone else is bad and we're good. They're lost and we're saved. And they didn't really feel a burden. They thought everyone else was unclean, but we're clean. And so when Jesus said, keep in mind, don't be so smug about being a Jew and think you're going to be saved because you're a Jew. Because back in the days of Elijah, he wasn't sent to stay with a Jewish widow. There were plenty of widows in the land, but God sent him to stay with a special widow. He resurrected her sin, but she was a Gentile. And there were many Jewish lepers in the land in the days of Elisha and Naaman, but God didn't cleanse any Jewish lepers. He cleansed the hated enemy Naaman, an Assyrian who had attacked the Israelites. Can you understand why they got upset? He was basically saying, don't think that you're the only ones that God loves, the only ones that God's going to save because you are of a particular denomination. You listening? He that has ears, let him hear. Now, did God call the Jewish people? Did God save the Jewish people? But he was trying to let them know they were not the other ones. Or they were not the only ones. He, they were to go. Christ was sending a message to the Gentiles. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 11, verse 10, there's a prophecy. It says, In that day there will be a root of Jesse who will stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place will be glorious. The Gentiles would be seeking the Messiah. You can also read in chapter 42, same book, Isaiah. Verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one whom my soul delights. Who is that? This is the prophecy about the Messiah, Jesus. Jesus. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament talking about how God had a special message to the Gentiles. But when the Messiah came, before it went to the Gentiles, it was to go to the Jews first. You can read about this now in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for instance. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. But notice the sequence here. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Why do you say for the Jew first? Is it because Jews are better? No. Lord says in Christ in Galatians chapter 3, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, meaning we all have free access to salvation, but they were to hear it in a sequence. Jew first. Romans 2 verse 10. You can also read verse 9. Glory, honor, and peace to every man who works good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. When Christ sent the disciples out preaching, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, notice the mandate that he gave to the 12 apostles. By the way, 12 apostles were all Jews, right? Right? Yeah, that's not a trick question. <laughs> These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. But wait, Jesus, I thought you loved the Gentiles. Don't go to them yet. Go not in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the Samar city of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Now that didn't mean that all of the Jews were lost, but they had drifted so far from understanding what God's plan was. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus again is speaking. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Notice where they were to start witnessing. Who lived in Jerusalem? The Jews. And Judea, still Jewish, that's where you get the word Jew from Judah, and Samaria, now the circle's widening, and the uttermost parts of the ends of the earth. It was to start at home and then spread. Why would Jesus tell the 12 apostles when the Holy Spirit was poured out to start preaching among the Jews? Who had the shortest distance to travel to go from where they were to accepting Christ and understanding His ministry? Didn't the Jews already have the foundation in the Scriptures and the foundation in God and that it was one God, not many gods, and you're not supposed to worship idols and they had the Ten Commandments? They had all the fundamentals. They had a good foundation in the Scriptures and in their heritage, but they were missing some very key ingredients. And so the disciples were to preach to them first because they didn't have that far to go. That's why Christ said to that one lawyer, you're not far from the kingdom. That's why John the Baptist began to preach to the Jews. Romans 3 verse 1 and verse 3, what advantage then has the Jew? What is the advantage of being Jewish? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly, there's many ways in other words, but chiefly to them were committed the oracles of God. The scriptures were given to the Jewish nation. The Bible's written by one people with the exception of the book of Luke and a small passage that was uh, narrated by Nebuchadnezzar and maybe Darius, the rest of it, it's all written by Jewish authors. And so uh, I think that this is significant. Uh, the Lord says, first go to the Jews. Go to your own people who have the Scriptures, but maybe they don't understand some of the details. Now, why am I saying this? When I do evangelism, and I advertise to come to an evangelistic meeting. We'll be doing this soon with uh, Eric and Hilda Lisa Fleckinger. That handbill is going to have things that will attract people who already know a little bit about Christianity. It's going to say things like, you know, do you want to understand the last days? Do you want to understand Bible prophecy? Do you want to understand something about the beasts of Revelation? Who is going to be interested in that? Probably people with Christian background. Atheists. The typical, you know, Buddhist or um, Hindu or even Muslim, they're not going to usually be attracted by those handbells. So why do we do it that way? Do we believe that God has given a special message to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? So who are those who would be the best suited to first embrace that message and then to take it to the world? It would be Christian people who have not yet heard these uh, distinctive truths that were lost. One of the messages of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is we are restoring the paths to dwell in. The dark age is a truth. The beast power casts the truth to the ground. Part of cleansing the sanctuary. Sanctuary is the church of God. Isn't that right? Not only is Christ cleansing the sanctuary in heaven, but the sanctuary, God's body on earth. His temple on earth has been defiled by the darkness of the dark ages and those false teachings. And so we've got a message that helps also to cleanse the sanctuary on earth by sharing the truth. Every lie and every falsehood to some extent defiles. If Jesus is the truth that sets you free, every misunderstanding does something to obscure a person's concept of God. It does something to enslave. Truth sets you free. Lies enslave. And you know, there's going to be a big shaking someday. Well, I'll get to that later. Anyway, uh, that's in my notes here, so I'll get to that later. So do you understand why it's important to go to these other sheep that are going to hear his voice? They're his sheep. Let me see if I could put it this way. There's been a terrorist explosion, a bomb. In this country, these terrorists had all these captives that were locked up. And when the bomb went off where all of these dear people were imprisoned, 
a number of them were in an open area, and the walls and things fell on them. A number of them were in prison cells. So you get to the scene, and there's people that are wounded. There's people that are under crushed uh, debris. They need help. They need to be triaged. And then you've got folks, because they were in the cells, they're protected, but they're still locked up. So you get there, and you're by yourself. And you've got to try and help all these people who are injured and all the people locked up. What do you do first? Well, the people with the greatest need are the ones who are crushed under the concrete and under the debris that are bleeding. But then you got all these, you can say, look, you guys are just locked up, you're okay, but because you were in the cells, you're protected. No, no, what I do is I'd find a set of keys, first thing, and I'd open one cell. And then I'd give the keys to that guy and say, now you let everyone else out. And they can then help me triage a lot more people who are bleeding. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. All right, the world is lost. What is the fastest way for us to get the gospel to the world and triage this sin sick planet? If Seventh day Adventists would take the message to the other sheep that don't know, they're God's children, they've accepted Jesus, most of them believe the Bible. The Holy Spirit's working in their lives. They've got so many things that they know, but they haven't understood the three angels' message. They don't understand the particular truths that God has given to the remnant church. We're not just another church. Seventh-day Adventists are a movement into which all other people are being called in the last days. So we should not be apologizing for wanting to go with our message in a special way to Christians of other faiths. Now, you know, Amazing Facts also preaches in we, I preach in Hindu. You ever seen that? It's really something. Karen speaks in Hindu too. We've got our, our Revelation seminar translated in, in Hindi, and which of course the Hindus believe. And uh, I've got a really high voice. And it's something else really exciting. There's not too many Christians in China, but do you know I speak Mandarin? We just released the cosmic conflict in Mandarin. It's going to go all over the country because we've released 5,000. They will then replicate it on the black market and sell it. It'll be in every Christian church, all denominations. It's true. It's exactly what happened. We did this with the final events DVD. Oh, how, when were we in China? 06, we took 20 of them, just 20. Gave them to the underground church. They multiplied it and sold it to each other very industrious, and copied it. And because it's a digital, they didn't lose quality, and they copied it and copied it and copied it. And we've got a family working full-time now in China. We can't tell you their names. We call them Mr. and Mrs. Who. <laughs> and they said they had not run into a Christian group in China that has not seen the final events yeah. DVD. Yeah. That was 20, 20 DVDs that we took. So with 5,000 of the Cosmic Conflict DVDs. So we believe in taking the message to the whole world, but we've got a special work to do first among the lost sheep, among the other sheep, the ones who are in Babylon. So let me tell you what happens. You do that and then the time will come where they won't listen. Acts 13, 46. Paul and Barnabas, as they were preaching, they had a modus operandus as Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas, as they would go from town to town through Asia, a lot of pagans in the Roman Empire, where would they go first when they went into a new pagan town in a Greek or Roman country? The synagogue. Why? Because they already had the foundation. Some would accept. Some were, were noble-minded like the people of Berea. They accepted the truth. They accepted Jesus and churches were established, but not all accepted. You can read here in Acts 13, verse 46, Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, they didn't do that that day and stop preaching to Jews. They stopped preaching to Jews in that town. Then they'd go to the next town. And where would they go? Synagogue and they'd share what God had shared with them to the Jews. Acts 18, verse 6, But when they opposed him and blasphemed, they rejected the message of Jesus, he shook his garments. Remember what Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet? Paul literally did it. He shook his garments and he said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean now. 
I will go to the Gentiles in that town. And when he went to Rome and he was in prison, who did he speak to first? He met with the Jews that were there. And so if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, don't be apologetic about studying the Bible with Christians from other faiths. We're supposed to do that. Matter of fact, we don't want to neglect to do that or we could be hoarding the message. We don't want to think that we're just going to stay in our church. You guys stay in your church. We'll stay in our church. We've got to have a feeling of missionary zeal and yearning to see the lost saved and see this message get out. You know, sometimes we've got the attitude, hey, you know, we've got the truth. Praise the Lord, we've got the truth. Yeah, I know they lay at our gate full of sores, starving for our crumbs, but that must be because God doesn't care about them. And God wants us to care about this message. It does make a difference, and people are liberated when they learn it. Luke 16, 19, you remember that story? There was a certain rich man, clothed in purple, fine linen, talking now about gospel gluttons, fared sumptuously. That means he feasted sumptuously every day. I'm going to rush through this. You know the parable. Rich man, beautiful clothes, feasting every day. Poor beggar named Lazarus lies at his gate full of sores, desires to be fed with the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. But the rich man just keeps feasting with his buddies and he never gives anything to the beggar at his gate who finally dies of starvation or sickness. But the poor beggar goes to Abraham's bosom. Well, wait a second. Every Jew thought he was going to Abraham's bosom just because he was Jewish. And the rich man dies and he is not in Abraham's bosom. He's in torment, which is what the Greeks thought happened to you when you died. You notice the reversal of identities here? The poor beggar represents the Gentiles. They believed you went to Hades where you are tormented by the god Pluto. The Jews believed that you were in the presence of Abraham. You could embrace Abraham, your father, if you were saved. And all of a sudden now he says the opposite happens when they die. All of a sudden the Gentile beggar the, who's being nursed or licked by the dogs, he goes to Abraham. And Abraham, he's going to the Gentile place of torment, which was fictitious, Hades. And then the rich man says, Father Abraham, I don't get it. So I'm tormented in this flame. Could you at least send Lazarus? He knows his name because he passed him every day, didn't give him anything to eat. Send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in a drop of water and put it on my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham answers and said, Sorry, no changing sides now. It's too late. Once you die, it's pointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. There's no second chance after death. There is a great gulf fixed so that those who would pass from us to you cannot and you can't come here. A great gulf fixed. Bigger than the Grand Canyon. Once you're lost, there's a gulf fixed. Destinies are sealed. That's why now is the time. Amen? Amen? And so the rich man calls the father Abraham and he says, oh, if you just send him back to my father's house because I've got five brethren. All the Jews agreed on at least the five books of the Pentateuch. In my father's house. That was the temple. He says if he'd go back if Lazarus would tell them about this great loss and this suffering, they'd straighten up and they'd care more about the poor and they'd believe. And Abraham says, well, they've got Moses and the prophets. And he said, oh, no, but if someone went to them from the dead, signs and wonders, if they saw a sign, then they'd believe. I'm paraphrasing. If they believe not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one should rise from the dead. What does that parable mean? we are at risk of making the same mistake in every denomination that the Jews made. Of thinking, we've got the truth, we've got our church, we've got the lost all around us, but we're going to get together and feast on the word every day. Isn't it wonderful to have the truth? Praise the Lord, we're saved. And have no passion for the lost around us that are, the only comfort they get is the dog's tongues. The dogs were a symbol of the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus said it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. Speaking of the Gentiles, that's what he said. And that's what the Jews called the Gentiles, dogs. When Christ was on the cross, one prophecy said, the dogs have encompassed me. He was crucified by the Gentiles. And so this is saying we can't think because we've got the truth and we don't care about those around us that are starving, we're just to get together and feast. We may find that in the judgment, the throne is going to be surrounded by 
not only Baptists and Presbyterians and people from all these other denominations that we thought, well, wait, but we had the truth. What are they doing there? But it's going to be, there'll be some Buddhists there. There's going to be some Hindus there. There'll be some Muslims there who didn't know and they walked in the light they had. They were hungering for the food of truth. They just didn't have it. See, we're judged according to the truth we have. Do we live up to it? Everybody there is there because of Jesus. There's only one name given among men whereby we're saved. You got that? Nobody's there because of works. They're all saved by the grace of Jesus and faith they had in God. Very few of them will be there because they didn't know the truth. But some learned a little and they lived up to it. That's why it's so important for us to have a burden to share it with them. So we don't want to be gospel gluttons. Now, where are the great body of believers? You know, one reason I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is because of this point. Before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I studied with Christians from many different groups. And not all, but many of them would say, unless you're a member of our church, you're not going to make it. Only members of our church are going to make it. Unless you speak in tongues like we do, you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're lost. Unless you're a member of our church, you're not one of the 144,000. And there was a lot of that, and that used to bother me. And you know, I'd been around the world already, and I, I'd seen so many things, I thought, you can't tell me that God is going to consign to hell everybody else that is not a member of this one church. And then I was reading that book, Great Controversy. And the statement in there, by the way, this is page 390. And it says, Notwithstanding, in spite of, the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the churches that constitute Babylon. Listen. The great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. So if you're looking down from heaven on this earth and you want to say, where are the biggest bulk, the greatest mass of Christ's true followers. They're not in our church. They're in the other churches. There are approximately one billion Christians in the world. There are about 17 million as of this message, Seventh-day Adventists. The majority of true Christians, well, first of all, don't assume within yourself that everybody in our church is saved. You all know that? Maybe one in 20 I read somewhere. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. Not everybody on the church books is in the book of life. We all know that, right? The greatest part of Christ's true followers are not in our church at all. They're in these other churches. God looks down at them. They've accepted the plan of salvation. They love him. They just don't understand all the truth. I've got news for you. King David didn't understand all the truth. He had too many wives, right? And Abraham didn't understand all the truth. He had too many wives and he had slaves. And so, you know, God winked at the times of ignorance. You see what I'm saying? Man looks in the outside, God looks on the heart. Mark 9, verse 38 to 40. And John answered and said, Master, the Apostle John said to Jesus, we saw somebody casting out devils in your name, but he doesn't follow us. And we forbade him because he doesn't follow us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man that shall do a miracle in my name that can speak evil of me, for he that is not against us is on our part. So is the Lord working with and using many of these people in these other churches out there? Amen. Absolutely. I'll tell you, you know, I, I don't know if I, how much I should tell you, but it's the truth. I've got... Um, Radio in my car preset to a couple of different Christian stations. And I listen to some good gospel messages from pastors from all different walks of life. Now, praise the Lord, I've got a filter in my mind. And it's like, you know, if you make an apple juice, you don't want to swallow the seeds. You've got to filter them out. You watermelon, you spit out the seeds. And I've got a, what I think is a biblical filter. I understand the present truth. And when these guys, dear as they are, and wonderful as they are, they say a lot of great things. All of a sudden they say something about, well, we know she's gone on to be with the Lord now and she's in heaven. I go, you know, you just realize that isn't right. They don't know better. Or when they talk about, you're going to burn in hell forever and ever. Well, they were reading the Bible up until they got to that part. And so, you know, you've got to have a filter in your head. But 
God is still working among his people that are scattered throughout the, these uh, different churches. We don't have a copyright on truth. Do you know that? I believe the Seventh-day Adventist church, God has committed the oracles of truth to us. I believe we are the equivalent of modern Israel. He's given us a special message. But God still has the greatest part of his true people in these other churches. And does he still cast out devils through them even though they don't walk with us? Jesus said, don't forbid them. They're doing it in my name. Does it make a difference what church you're part of? Oh, yeah, well, what are you doing here? You're not sure of that answer? Does it make a difference what church you're part of? Yes, it does because you basically are endorsing the teachings of that church. And so I am thankful I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I don't agree with everything Seventh-day Adventists are doing. But the foundational teachings of the church, I don't know anywhere else to go. These are the oracles of truth. That's why I'm here. God wants his people to be one. John chapter 10, verse 16. This was our verse. He wants one fold. Other sheep I have, oh, you kids still keeping track? Which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one fold, one flock, and one shepherd. Now, the devil has very successfully fragmented God's church. Is that God's plan? He wants his body together. He wants us to be united on truth. What's going to happen in the last days? You're going to hear a lot of eloquent Christians saying, let's put aside all of our doctrinal differences and let's just be one and let's find a few points that we're in common on and forget about all the other doctrines and let's just unite. No, 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 no. You don't say we're going to unite while we sacrifice truth. We need to unite on the truth. And yes, not all agree, but we're going to have to study and find out what does God say. There's going to be a great revival in the last days. His people are going to come together. At the same time that the beast power is working to create this confederacy of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, a counterfeit worship. You listening? Counterfeit church. God's Spirit is going to be working and His sheep in these many different churches are going to hear His voice. You see, the devil heard Jesus say, John 13, 15, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. How is the world supposed to know Christians are real? By our love, by our unity. The devil heard that and he thought, well, if they're recognized by their love for one another, then if I can get the Protestants and Catholics to bomb each other, who's going to want to be a Christian? If I can get the Christians at each other's throats, who's going to want to be a Christian? So the devil has tried to cause a lot. He smeared the name of Christ in the world by fragmenting his body. So in the last days, God has raised up a church. The Seventh-day Adventist church is a melting pot of many different denominations. You know your church history? We didn't all just migrate out of the Catholic Church or out of the Baptist Church. We are a melting pot of many people who basically said, we agree to put aside our denominational creed and say, what does the Bible really say? No matter how unpopular it has become, we're going to get back to the faith that was delivered to the apostles. Amen. And that's how this church was formed. Hey, let me finish reading a quote. I started reading 390. The greatest part of Christ's true followers are found in their communion. There are many of these who have never seen the special truths for this time. Not a few are dissatisfied with their present condition and they're longing for clear light. They look in vain for the image of Christ in the churches to which they're connected. As these bodies depart further and further from the truth. Are you seeing many of the churches drifting further from the Bible? As these bodies depart further and further from the truth and ally themselves more closely with the world, the difference between the two classes will widen. There will be a polarizing between one group having the mark of the beast and the other group having the seal of God. They're going to polarize around unity. The other group is going to polarize around biblical truth. Amen. It, will, it says here, let me finish this quote. The difference between the two classes will widen and it will finally result in separation. They'll separate. The time will come when those who love God supremely can no longer remain and connected with those who are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 
You see, Jesus' prayer that we are one is going to be answered. Amen. John 17, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The final great revival in the world is going to result, the world may believe, why? Because we're one. So there's going to be a coming together of Christians from many different backgrounds and stripes and types based on Scripture, on their word, Christ said. Does that make sense? And God is calling people out of Babylon. That's part of the three angels' message. God has His sheep in Babylon, and before the last judgment falls on Babylon and her daughters, a message is given, come out of her, my people. Of course, that's Revelation 18, verse 2. This angel cries mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the dwelling place of demons, and a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. By the way, Jesus and the apostles had to call people out of Judaism, really. Now, you don't stop being a Jew, but they had to call people out of that system when they accepted Christ. You don't continue to sacrifice lambs, do you? A lot of things had changed. So there was a calling out that happened. Many of them were already kicked out of the churches. Revelation 18, 4, I heard another voice saying, come out of her, my people. Notice what God says about those in Babylon. My people. Jesus said, other sheep I have. These are his sheep. They're his people. My sheep hear my voice. How do they hear his voice? Through his word. And that'll be through you and I proclaiming his word. Now, I have been accused before of sheep stealing. <laughs> and I like to be liked like everyone else. I, I would prefer that people don't call me a thief. Um, frankly, I think the devil is the thief. Matter of fact, you can read John 10 verse 1, speaking of the sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not the, by the door into the sheepfold but climbs up some other way the same as a thief and the robber and the devil has come to kill and to destroy the devil is the thief what we're doing is trying to get him back he's the one who's taken Jesus sheep he is a horse thief and a sheep thief and we're trying to get the Lord's sheep back and so yes we do have a message to the other churches and we want them to come back to the truth they were stolen during the dark ages they were stolen by the devil with all the apostasy and paganism that came into the church. And so, what do you want? Do you want me to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I know it's in the Bible, but we don't want to bother you because, you know, you seem comfortable. That's not the attitude of Christians. We should feel an urgency to get the truth out. And yeah, you'll be accused of sheep stealing. You'll be accused of being a demon. You'll be accused of being a cult. You'll be accused of all kinds of things. Jesus said, you're in good company. They accused me too, right? Didn't Christ call a bunch of people in a new way and as they all left and began to follow Jesus and the apostles the religious leaders were infuriated because everyone was following this new Christian teaching they said you're stealing our sheep well it was the truth right, right. and when Pentecost happened who was it that was converted 3,000 baptized in one day they were Jews being baptized into the church of Jesus and the priests were saying sheep stealers isn't that right so, of course, where else are the apostles going to start? They're going to start with the Jews. And that's what they did. And then they went to the Gentiles. And they had to mix it up. And we do that too. Now, there's a great shaking coming. What's going what's to really be the catalyst to bring all these people out of Babylon? And this is something I really want you to think about. There is going to be a great shaking. John chapter 6, verse 66 through 68. Remember, I preached on this about two weeks ago. When Christ was preaching the truth, it caused division. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said, do you also want to go away? And Peter said, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of life. What was it that caused the shaking? The words of Christ. And when the straight testimony is proclaimed, it will cause a shaking among God's people. Amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Christ said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. 
but the children of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I'm looking at the clock and thinking I'm, I'm out of time but I'm not quite out of sermon yet so bear with me a moment longer, okay? There's going to be a big shaking. And you know what's going to happen as the truth is preached? Some who are in our ranks are going to go, you know, I just, this is too straight for me. This is too strict. This is too restrictive. This is too legalistic. You'll hear all kinds of things. Whatever the reasons are, they say, I'm out of here. I'm going to go join Babylon. Is that already happening? Yes. It is. Amen. But you know, I can tell you, friends, I just came back from the NRB, and there's a whole lot of those people that are going to come flowing into our ranks at the same time because they're going to go, where have you been? At Amazing Facts, we get mail like this every single week. People write in and they say, I heard this message. I just went through your Bible school. We saw some evangelistic program. We went to one of your evangelistic meetings and I have been a Christian all my life. Where have you been? I've never heard these things before. And they take a stand. Amen. And so at the same time that people are leaving, others are coming in. Let me read that to you from the Spirit of Prophecy. The book is early writings. This is part of a, an incredible vision of God's people on the way to the kingdom. I can't read the whole thing. But as they're going up this path on the way to the kingdom, it says in page 271, early writings, the numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless, the indifferent, those who did not join were those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain that victory. They were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Let both grow together until the harvest. And then there's a shaking. You may not be able to tell what's the wheat and what's the tares, but there's going to be a shaking. Where are you going to be when that happens? Let me get real specific here for a minute. As I visited with my Christian friends from every possible denomination this last week, they're grappling with many of the same problems that we're grappling with in our church. Did you know that? We're not alone. They're struggling with people who are introducing evolution in their churches. And they're saying, but the Bible is very clear and science is clear. God created. We didn't evolve. I said, hey, I can commiserate with you. We're having the same problem. Same-sex marriage? I'm ashamed to even speak it, but there were those who were clamoring that we should accept that in our church. I was shocked that anybody would take that position. I was shocked by how much support it received. Shocked. I had no idea that abortion, pagan worship styles. Someone gave me a manuscript. Non-Seventh-day Adventist. They're, they're part of some evangelical church. They said, Pastor Doug, we watch your programs. I just wrote a book. I think that you might enjoy this. Could you read it and, and maybe tell me what you think? So I took the manuscript back to my room. I started reading it, and I thought, man, it sounds like it's written by Joe Cruz. <laughs> I agree with it all. He's talking about we got to get away from just this external worship. We, God wants obedience in our lives. we got to believe in the Ten Commandments and still believe we're saved by grace. We need to, you know, get back to living the Christian life and representing Jesus. I'm going, amen, 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 amen. And I thought, you know what? I agree with that but members of my own church want it. There, there are God's people out there. The Holy Spirit's working on them and they know they're battling with the same things. That were. There's some people come up and they say, Pastor Doug, our church, I don't know what's going on. They're beginning to think it's okay to drink a little bit for Christians. I say, hey, join the club. We got that problem in our church. And you know, I kind of had to hang my head I think I told you that uh, Answers in Genesis, they teach that I do a great work. They've got a great magazine for kids on creation. And uh, their booth was right across from ours. And, and Brother Ken Ham, who runs that operation, I spoke to him a couple times while we were there. He didn't say this to me, but he said it to one of our other pastors. He said, you know, you Adventists, in your writings, he said, you sound like us. You sound like you believe in creation, but you know, your universities are teaching evolution. What's that? And so he was kind of looking at us like, I can't get too close to you guys because, and I was ashamed because he's right, some of our universities are teaching evolution. And so there's going to be a shaking and you're going to see people gravitating to birds of a feather flock together. And when this crisis comes, I'll tell you friends, I don't know if it's gotten your attention, but 
that, that historic earthquake in Haiti, that apocalyptic earthquake in Chile, then this, what, within the same week, one in Taiwan. Somewhere in this line, San Francisco is going to get hit, you think. I'm not, I'm not wishing anything on them. I mean, just you follow around the ring of fire. It seems like that's going to happen one of these days. There's going to be some calamity, and people are going to start running to churches out of fear, and people are going to say, well, we need to get back to the Word. We're doing something wrong. And you're going to see two groups. You know, I'm going to close with one final parable. I won't read it all to you, but it's found in Luke 14, verse 16. A man gives a great supper feast, and he invites many. And I guess they say, sure, we'll come, but when the time actually comes, they say, you know, we're really comfortable where we're at. We're not going to go. And the king is terribly insulted because he's paid an awful lot for, this, for their seat at this feast. And so he says, all right, to his servants, you go out in the highways and the byways. And they go out and they say, we found lots more that came in. He says, go out into the hedges. Go get the lame, the maimed. He says, you bring them in from the outside and we'll give away their seats. There's going to be a great shaking and some people are going to lose their seats. I remember one time getting a little late to a flight. Plane was full. I'd reserved a seat. I said, yes, I want to go. But I was delayed and when I got there, it was past the boarding time. You know what they do with your seats on those full flights if you're too late? They give it away. You want someone to take your seat? Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Revelation verse 11. Hold fast what you have that no man takes your crown. The Lord's bought you a crown of everlasting life. He's given you the truth. He wants us to be doers of His word and not hearers only. He doesn't just want us to be members of the church. He wants us to be members of His body. He wants us to be at one with Him. That's how we're to be at one with each other. And the way we're one with Him is we hear His voice and there will be one fold and one shepherd. God is calling all of His sheep to follow Him. Are you wanting to be one of those sheep that follow His word? No matter what the churches do, including ours, you follow the word. Amen? That's where I'm going. Hi friends, Amazing Facts is so excited to tell you about our new Prophecy Study Bible. It's filled with everything you could ever want in a Bible. It's got the maps, red letter edition, concordance, and all 27 of the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides are in here to help you in your personal study and to help you study the Word with your friends. If you'd like to know how you can get a copy of this incredible study Bible, call the toll-free number on the screen or go to our website, amazingfacts.org.